Okay, so bearing all that in mind, can you draw me three graphs, all conch time graphs, one for what you think will happen to a zero order reactant, one for a first order, and one for a second order? Remember, these are reactants. If we're talking about an order of something, it's of a reactant. So think about how the conch will change over time. And just before you get started, I'm going to give you one clue. On a conch time graph, if we were to find the gradient, well, the way you get the gradient is the difference in conch over the difference in time. So what will that equal? What is conch over time? other than the gradient. The change in conch over time, moles per decimal cubed per second. Fantastic guys, the rate. So the gradient is your rate of reaction. So if you've got a really steep gradient, that means you've got a fast rate of reaction. A really shallow gradient would mean a really slow rate of reaction. So bear that in mind when you're thinking about this, and remember those rules from earlier about the relationship between conch and rate for these orders. If you ask me, it's not a proper definition because this is an effect, not a cause. But if it was zero order, you could say the rate has no effect on the conch. Okay. Because first of all, you said the rate is proportional to the conch. Yeah. So it's got two ways to do that. If you ask me, the, the actual definition would be the number of molecules of that reacting in the rate determining step. Yeah, do just be careful with this, this often catches a lot of people out. So there's actually two sets of graphs we need to learn for this topic. There's the conch time graphs and the rate conch graphs. So you just do have two separate boxes in your head for that. We're only going to do conch time graphs today. Okay guys, let's have a look at this then. So let's say our starting conch is here. Right, well, it could be wherever, let's say it's there. As it's reacting, as the reaction goes on, the concentration will drop. But remember, the gradient is the rate of reaction. Now for a zero order chemical, what relationship was there between conch and rate? What did we say? That's it. Yeah, they, they don't affect each other. 
for a zero order reactor. So as the concentration drops, what is going to happen to my rate of reaction? If there's no relationship. It'll stay the same, won't it? But remember, the rate of reaction is the gradient, the steepness. So as the concentration drops, the steepness will stay the same. What do you call a curve that has a constant, well, wouldn't you that has a constant steepness? Just a straight line, isn't it? That's, that's supposed to be a straight line. My attempt at a straight line. Yeah? Look, as the concentration is dropping, the rate of reaction is remaining constant. The gradient is remaining constant. Now, for a first order reactor, as the concentration drops, pardon me, <coughs> as the concentration drops, what effect will that have on the rate? Absolutely, it'll decrease the rate proportionally. Now, if you think about that, that means as the concentration drops, my gradient, my rate, will start to level out proportionally. So I'll try and do this neatly. So you get something ish like that. As one drops, the other drops. Now, what did we say the relationship was for a second order chemical? The rate is proportional to the number of moles. We've got quite a lot of back in the notes. Second order, rate is proportional to uh, the concentration squared. The concentration squared. So whatever you start doing to your conk, that's going to have a massive effect on the rate. So is my gradient, my rate, is it going to level out slower, or is my rate going to level out faster? much faster, isn't it? Exponentially faster. And so what you can imagine doing is taking your first order graph, pinching it, and pulling it towards the origin, like that. And so you're going to get... Oh, sorry, it's hard to do the board. Something-ish like that. Look, with my first order, the rate leveled out about here. Look at all that time that's gone. Because it's only got a proportional change. With my second order, the rate leveled out about here. Much quicker, wasn't it? Because of that proportional squared effect, is what it is. They are the three comp time graphs for zero, first, and second order. Definitely make sure you've got this down in your notes. Definitely get that down. The idea that the gradient is the rate. Because what you could be asked to do, and we'll do this in a second, is calculate the actual rate of reaction. So you just literally draw a tangent to whatever time you want, and then do change in conco with the change in time. Okay, so what we've got here is a table, and the way this works is we've got a certain number of experiments and in each experiment, we have different concentrations of chemicals. So here's the conk of A, conk of B, conk of C. And in experiment 1, we had 0.01, 0.01, 0.05. And then we measured the rate of reaction, or what we we'll say the initial rate of reaction. And it was found to be that. We changed some of the conks and did it again, and then again and again. Now there's a method where we can use this table to had me to actually calculate what the order of a chemical is. And it works like this. We need to pick, that's like isolate, two experiments where the concentration of only one chemical changes. So let's say I'm trying to find out about A. Have a little chat in your pairs, or if you're at home, just do it on your own. Two experiments where only A changes. What would they be? What experiment numbers would they be? Experiment one and four? Yeah? You could say, well, what about experiment two and four? But B also changes then. What about experiment three and four? But C also changes then. So we're trying to isolate where only the chemical we care about has changed conk. 
And so would we agree that between experiments one and four, the concentration of A has increased by a factor of two? Yeah, so that, that's the terminology to use, has increased by a factor of. So now we know what has happened to the conch, we can look at, and because it's only A that changed, we can look at the effect that has had on the rate and then figure out whether it's zero first or second order. So the conch of A increased by a factor of two, what has the initial rate increased by a factor of? Two. Two, right? 2.3 divided by that is two. And so would we agree that that's a proportional change? And so A must be first order. Yeah. So this is this is called the initial rates table method, or I just call it the big table method. Let's do B then. We'll do B together. So pick two experiments where only B changes. One and two. So here's what we say. Between experiments one and two, the concentration of B has increased by a factor of two. This has increased the rate by a factor of, well, 4.6 divided by 1.15 is four. That's how you figure it out. So conquer B has increased by a factor of two. The initial rate has increased by a factor of four. So therefore B is second order. Have a little go on your own at D and C. Just scroll it down some notes, so what's doing in your head. sentence in a second. Absolutely right. Between experiments two and three, the concentration of C increased by a factor of two. This had no effect on rate, therefore C is zero order. Okay? So there's a sentence I was saying there. Definitely get this down. This is always your answer to that. This is what you do. You literally just fill in the blanks. So it's just a fill in the blanks activity, really. Now, you have to memorize that sentence. And unfortunately, if you've got three different chemicals, you do need to write that down three times, once for each chemical. So it does get a little bit laborious, but that is your explanation. And then what we'll see end of this week, probably next week, is how we can use these orders to make something called a rate equation. And we can use a rate equation to do a two-step mechanism, which is where we're heading to. So get that down.
head. Have a crack at that one. So using that sentence in your notes, try and figure out what the orders of SO3 and O2 are. Definitely worth actually writing that paragraph down each time and fill in the blanks because it's a good practice. And so if you do it enough times, you'll just remember it. So let's go through this then. I won't write down those whole sentences every time, but like I say, you definitely should do. So between experiments one and three, the concentration of SO3 increases by a factor of two, and the initial rate increases by a factor of, well, 7.28 divided by 1.8, so I'm guessing that's four, which is two squared. Therefore, SO3 is second order. And O2, between experiments 1 and 2, increases by a factor of 3, and the initial rate increases by a factor of 3, so O2 is first order. Okay. So that's how we get the orders. The next step is we need to put these orders into what's called a rate equation. And it works like this. The rate equation is rate, so your, your rate of reaction, will be equal to the rate constant which we give small k. Now if it was capital K, that would be the equilibrium constant, wouldn't it? So annoyingly, it's the same symbol, but this is small k. And, then, and this is just a number. And this represents just, in general, how fast your reaction is likely to be. There's actually a lot of factors which go into this small k, which we're not going to get into. But it just, it's just a number which, for a fixed temperature, will be fixed. Now, if you change the temperature, it'll change it, but for a fixed temperature, it'll be the same number each time, and it just tells you how likely your rate is, how fast your rate is likely to be. And we're going to multiply that by the concentration of each reactant. Now, we're saying we've got two reactants, and we raise that concentration to the power of the order. So we just said SO3 was second order, so I'd have a 2 there. We said O2 was first order, so I'd have a 1 there, but we don't need to bother writing that, because a number to the power 1 is just a number. Now, let's say I had a third chemical, chemical C, let's say, uh, and so I could write C there, 
And let's say C was zero order. What's a, a number raised to the power zero? Just one, right? And a number multiplied by one is just the same number. So you could do this if you wanted, but we usually wouldn't include zero order chemicals. It's just what's the point? They're just the number one. So we don't include them. But first and second, we would include. So this would be our rate equation for this experiment there. Okay. Here's two more. Can you, let's just do the first one for now. Have a crack at that one. And then not only would I like you to write those two paragraphs, can you then go a step further and can you construct a rate equation? If you're really zipping ahead, and I've not explained how to do this yet, but you can have a go, you can rearrange this to actually find the value of K for that temperature. Okay. So what I'm going to do for people at home is I'm going to pause the tape, and you can just press play. You can pause it and then press play when you're done. Okay, let's have a look through question one then. <coughs> so we know that rate is going to equal K multiplied by the concentration of each chemical raised to the power of its order. Let's have a look at NO. So I'm thinking between experiments one and two, the concentration of NO has increased by a factor of two, and the initial rate has increased by a factor of four, two squared, therefore NO must be second order. So I can say NO conquer NO squared. For O2, between experiments 1 and 2, the conquer O2 has increased by a factor of 3, and the initial rate has increased by a factor of 3, therefore O2 is first order. So that's my rate equation, so like one mark for each of those between experiments sentences, one mark for getting the rate equation, Next, we need to feed in some values and rearrange to find k. So k is going to be equal to, pull these conks underneath, rate divided by NO squared O2. Then we just need to feed in the values. Now you can pick any experiment you want to feed in the values. I always just go for experiment 1. So my conk of uh, NO is 0 0.001. So 0 0.001 squared, O2 was 0 0.001, and the rate was 1.82 times 10 to the minus 6. Be really careful, very often, and I've just not been doing it now because I'm such a nice guy, but very often they'll have initial conch slash moles per decimeter cubed times 10 to the minus 4 in the column at the top. Now obviously as you're just reading this number, you might not think to check the heading. So do always check the headings for times ten to this. Yeah, because you'll need to take that into account in your number. If I come here, bang all that in and you'll get your answer, get an answer for Dill. Uh, one point eight two times ten to the minus fifteen. Minus fifteen was that it. Cool. Now that might seem like a ridiculous number. Your great constant there's no like safety net to see if it looks right. It could be really, really small. It could also be times 10 to the plus 15, right? It can vary massively. So if it looks like an odd number, don't let that phase you. They often are really odd numbers. In terms of units, well, what's the units of rate of reaction? If rate of reaction is changing conch over time, that will be so rate equals change in conch over time, which is moles per decimeter cubed per second. So how do I get that second to the top? Reverse the sound of the power. So this is your units of rate always, moles per decimeter cubed per second. You can actually get different units, but in this, that's what the units will always be. So moles per decimeter cubed per second, 
Each of these concentrations is a moles per decimeter cubed, just like we was doing a KC expression or a K, well, KC expression. So I've got three of those terms, so that's moles to the three decimeters to the minus nine. We can then cancel. Moles will take that to two. That will take that to minus six. And then to get those on the top, we reverse the sign of the power, so that will be decimeters to the positive six, moles to the minus two, and it always will end in per second. Always. Because you always have per second for rate, and that will never cancel with a conch, will it? Because conchs don't contain per second. So your units of K, the decimeters and the moles can change, depending on your total order. We would say it's the overall order, but you'll always end in per second. Yeah, what is the integral rate quantity? It is a number, a value, which is determined by lots of different things involving temperature, activation energy, how often they're going to collide in the correct orientation. So there's many factors that affect it. You can think of it as a number which tells you, in general, how fast is your rate happening. So if you had a really low K, this is a really low K, that means, in general, you're going to have quite a slow rate of reaction. You're going to need very high concentrations for it to be a quick one. Yeah. I don't know if it's one, but I got like 1,000. Uh, you probably just didn't do brackets properly in the calculator. I, know, I think just, just double check. If, it, if you find you, you keep on getting it wrong when you do this, do it in stages. So do 0.001. Okay. Anybody else get that same answer? Anybody yeah. else ever did? Yeah. 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 Uh, possible or can't. Whatever it is, you can stick there in the calculator and you'll, and you'll get whatever the answer is when it comes out as. And we haven't got a calculator, we need to check that now. But as long as you've got the method, that's what counts. Okay, so this one has an additional trick with it. So if you were to find two experiments where only A changes, what, what two experiments is there where only A changes? Experiments one and one and four? Yeah, so we can do an experiment where only A changes. What would be two experiments where only B changes? One and two. What about two experiments where only C changes? There isn't, is there? there is, so there's a problem here. Well, it's not a problem, it's just an extra thing we need to deal with. There isn't only two experiments where only C changes. So let's go through and do A and B. So rate equals K. So between experiments one and four, the concrete increases by a factor of two, and the rate increases by a factor of four. Therefore, A is second order. Between experiments, what was it, one and two, between experiments one and two, the conch of B increases by a factor of five, and the rate remains constant, therefore B is zero order, so I'm not even going to bother writing it, I'll just keep track, B equals zero. And then we've got this problem with C. Notice as well, I've got a times 10 to the minus three in the heading now, so do watch out for that, often they will be in the headings. So what we need to do is employ something called a halfway house. Now as I can't write on this board, imagine you're put like a little arrow coming out to here. Yeah. yeah. Sasha. Um, something zero order, and that's the one that also changes. Can you just ignore it? Yes, but yes, but that won't always be the case. Sometimes it'll be a first order. So I'm just going to go through the method as though you couldn't do that. Because, yes. So what's going to happen is, let's say for experiment C, we're going from experiment 1 and 3. So here's my arrow from 1, here's my arrow from 3. Yeah? So I've got 4.32 and 58.32. Now, if I have a football, here's Jack and here's Jill, and they have a football, and between them, they keep the football 100 metres between them. How far did Jack keep the football? We don't know, do we? 
right? But if we knew that Jill kicked the football 60 metres, then Jack must have kicked it. We're going to employ this exact same idea here. First of all, we're going to take into account the effect of the chemical we know the order of. Now, between experiments one and three, A has increased by a factor of three. But A is, is second order, isn't it? So if between experiments one and three, A has increased by a factor of three, that would increase the initial rate by a factor of nine, three squared. So by taking into account A, we can do 4.32 times nine, so we want to bang that in the calculator. Oh, it was an experiment one. Yeah, it was experiment one. Oh yeah, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. And so if A has got us from here to here, that's like Jill kicking the ball from there to there, what must have caused this remaining change? C, right? Because that's the only other thing that's changed. Now, what has C increased by a factor of between experiments one and three? Four divided by A is 4.5. So, so you can get decimals. So C between experiments one and three, the conch of C has increased by a factor of 1.5. 38.88 times 1.5 is 58.32. And so, therefore, we know C must be first order. So if you can't isolate two experiments where only your chemical changes, then find an experiment where your chemical and one other changes that you already know the order of, figure out the effect that that chemical you already know the order of would have had, this is what I call the halfway house, like in the middle. Whatever the remaining effect is, that must have been caused by the chemical you don't know the order of. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so have a crack at this one. I'm going to pause the video, you pause it too, and then press play when you're done. Okay, so let's build up our rate equation. So rate equals k. Well, for a between experiments one and three, the conch of a has increased by a factor of three. This has increased the initial rate by a factor of three. Therefore, a will be first order. Between experiments one and two, the conch of b has increased by a factor of two. This has increased the initial rate by a factor of four. Therefore, b is second order. And then c is the tricky one. So for C, I would look at experiments one and four. And the two chemicals that have changed between experiments one and four is C and B. I already know B, so let's figure out the effect of B first. Between experiments one and four, conch of B is increased by a factor of three. As B is second order, that would increase the initial rate by a factor of three squared, which is nine. So 9 times 7.2, anyone got that? 64.8, thank you very much. So I have now figured out the effects of B. My remaining delta, my remaining change, must have been caused by C. Between experiments 1 and 4, C has increased by a factor of 3, and it has increased the initial rate, is that 3? That looks like 3 to me. By a factor of 3, therefore C is first order. We would then just pick any experiment and feed in these numbers. Don't forget the rate is times 10 to the minus 4. And that's getting the answer. Okay, we kind of run out of time, so we'll call it there.